we're going to be looking, we're doing the Arba'in and Awiyya. And uh, we chose the explanation of Sheikh Abdul Muhsin. But there are places in the Sheikh's work where some of the issues are not as extensive as in the works of Sheikh Uthaymeen and definitely in the Sharh of Ibn Rajab. <coughs> because of that, we are going from time to time for the benefit of the brothers and sisters to look at some of the benefits from both Shuruh and uh, try and make it as abridged as possible and continue, inshallah. And the ahadith that we will be dealing with initially are those ones that are very short and easy to memorize. And all of the brothers and sisters probably have already memorized a lot of Ain and Awiyya, so it's not a problem any in terms of review. Okay? <clears throat> this particular narration that we're dealing with hadith Lakhamis is from Umm al Mu'mineen, Umm Abdullah Aisha, radiallahu anha. Qalat, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fawrad. Wa fi riwayatin li Muslim, Man amila amala laysa alayhi amrina fawrad. Both of these narrations, the first one is collected by both Bukhari and Muslim, the other by Muslim. Okay? All of the brothers have memorized this hadith, right? Okay, I'm going to pass the mic around, right? And uh, just, you know, give everybody an opportunity to. Yes, a few brothers to go and quote the hadith, saying that it's only what? That's two lines. Okay? We start with me right. I know we're meeting our Aisha earlier on. Call it. Call it. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Man ahdath fi amri na hada ma lisa minu fawrad. Wa fi riwayat al Muslim. Man amila amal lisa ali amru na fawrad. عن أم المؤمنين أم عائشة رضي الله عنها قالت قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من أحدث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد وفي رواية رواه البخاري ومسلم وفي رواية لمسلم من عمل عملا ليس عليه أمرنا فهو رد Uh, 
اه الاربعين نووية ايه who's gonna يعني just real briefly so we can continue the first hadith يلا اه عن امير المؤمنين ابي حفص عمر الخطاب رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم انما العمل بالنيات وانما لكل امر ما نوى فمن كان هجرته الى الله ورسوله فهجرته الى الله ورسوله ومن كان هجرته لدنيا يصيبها او امراه ينكحها فهجرته الى النهار والليل رواه البخاري ومسلم أمير المؤمنين أبي حفص عمر بن الخطاب رضي رضي الله عنه قال سمع عفوا سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته للدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه رواه إمام المحدثين أبو عبد الله محمد بن إسماعيل بن إبراهيم بن المغيرة بن بعدزبة البخاري وعبد الحسين مسلم بن الحجاج بن مسلم القشيري النيسابوري في صحيحيهما اللذين هما الصح الكتب كتب المصنفة طيب <coughs> okay <coughs> keeping with the uh, brevity of the subject matter we're just going to go through briefly the sharh of Sheikh Uthaymeen and uh, for the benefit of the brothers and sisters now <coughs> I said previously we're going to try and start off with the small narrations we should give you time to memorize the longer ones right there are only a few of them the Riwaya of Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Hadith of Jibreel, right? Abi Dhar, that particular Hadith. Only a few narrations in the Arba'in and Awi that are somewhat lengthy. So, whilst you brothers have memorized all the short ones, for those who have memorized the book already, it's just a review. Okay? Now, here, Shaykh <coughs> Uthameen, rahimahullah ta'ala, he starts out by explaining <coughs> the uh, kunya of Aisha radiallahu anha and this is uh, that she was uh, given the kunya Umm al and uh, this was actually for all of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu here two kunyas have been mentioned the other one is Umm Abdullah right now <coughs> there is a difference among the Ahlul Ilm whether or not Aisha radiallahu anha was pregnant and had a miscarriage but the most authentic narration that we have in respect to her is that this kunya was taken because of her Abdullah hey the Prophet sallallahu was approached by Aisha radiallahu anha O oh, Messenger of Allah, all of your wives have a kunya, I don't have one. And the Prophet ﷺ directed her to take the kunya of the son of her sister, who was Abdullah. Right? That is why she was known as Umm Abdullah. Radiallahu anha. Okay? <coughs> and um, here, <coughs> this particular narration. Starts out, من أحدث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فرد. This expression فرد, يعني that it is rejected. يعني مردوم دون على صاحبه. It is something a person who does something which is not in accordance with this affair of ours. The Sheikh is going to explain all of the Sheikh with him. All right, that it shall be rejected. All right. The other narration, whoever does a deed which is not in accordance with this affair of ours, it shall be rejected. So we have the hadith, the first narration, dealing with the person who actually introduces the innovation. 
and the other narration for the one whether he introduces it or not, the fact that he is acting upon it, he has the same type of warning. All right, <coughs> and here, Sheikh <coughs> Uthaymi he explains here. He says the statements of the Prophet sallallahu introduces something that did not exist. We will see, Yani, that sometimes an innovation doesn't mean that you don't have a text supporting something that you do. You may have a general text, all right, where the Prophet might have encouraged you to do something. But <clears throat> not looking at the amal of the Salaf, looking at how the Sahaba conducted themselves in respect to applying this text, you may go astray. So one of the things that keeps a person away from innovation is seeing how the general text or the general textual evidences that he have were actually applied during the time of the Prophet ﷺ and how it was understood by his companions. Otherwise, <coughs> most, I shouldn't say most, but many innovations that we have. People quote some type of text. The Prophet ﷺ praised dhikr. Alright? And you have a number of virtues in respect to remembrance of Allah. And so people say, well, what's wrong with it? That you gather together in a circle, in unison, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright? <clears throat> This type of innovation is what the Shatabi and some of the other of the Ahlul Ilm call al bidali Dafiya, which means that it has some textual evidence for the general act, but this specific application has no prior precedent. And so it's something that has to be considered, Yani, the way the Prophet acted with his companions and the way the companions understood the text and what they passed on to their students. And this is important. This is why Ibn Mas'ud, when he came across those groups or in the masjid, <coughs> and they were remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they were doing it in a way that was not very well known or was not known at all in the time of the Prophet. And he criticized them. Count your evil deeds, and I will stand, guarantee that none of your good deeds will go without any consequence. And then he criticized them. Okay? First, what is this that I see you doing? And they said, yeah, Abu Abdurrahman, I saw. And he, they considered it simple, something like, well, it's pebbles that we use in the count of tasbih and the tabir, the tahdeel. So, you know, so that we keep calm. And then he told them this. And then he brought them back to the methodology of the Salaf. Oh, to you, you nation of Muhammad, how quickly you destroy yourselves. Here are the companions of the Prophet. And if the companions of the Prophet are abundant, why do you think Ibn Mas'ud pointed to the companions of the Prophet? Why do you think Ibn Mas'ud <coughs> did this? Why? Because these were the people who sat at the feet of the Prophet ﷺ and they understood how the general textual evidences should have been applied. If you were doubtful about this, Al-Asraf Al-Ibad al man and the principle in respect to worship is that you don't do anything unless you have some specific text, not some general one. Right? You need some specific text. If you were doubtful, then before even acting, you should have gone and asked the companions. This actually is important because these people understood the Arabic language, right? They weren't ignorant of the Arabic language. Which means that it's not sufficient to understand the Arabic language. There's a methodology that we have to be upon if we're going to be saved. Especially in a time where you have so many different types of groups, different types of understandings. And so Ibn Mas'ud in this particular event 
pointed out, look, this should have been done first. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Shaykh Uthameen Rahimullah Ta'ala is going to explain some of that. He says, Amrina, whoever introduces something that has not been before in this affair of ours, yani fi dinina wa shariatina, in our deen and our sharia. Okay? Ma laysa minhu ma lam yushari'ahu Allah wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That which has not been legislated by Allah or the Prophet No difference was made by the Shaykh between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated or the Prophet Right? There's a difference, right? Huh? Is there a difference between what has been legislated by Allah in Adin and what has been legislated by the Prophet there's a narration that some of the Usuliyin use. Right? <clears throat> now, they say in this particular narration that when the Prophet said, Mu'ad ibn Jabal to Yemen, he said, What will you use to judge the people? Right? He said, Bikitabillah. With Allah's book. He says, Fa'illam tajid. If you don't find it in Allah's book, then with the son of the Prophet. Right? And then if you don't find it in the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, then I'll exert myself to try and find out what is correct from my own intellect, my own, you know, ishtihad. Is this narration, does that sound correct? Does it sound correct? No. Why not? Well, what it does that it shows that the sunnah, the message is not complete. Anything else? First of all, the narration is da'ifa. Had the riwayah da'ifa, it's not strong. Shows it's all right to lean upon your understanding. Anything else now? Hey. What it says is that, look, man, you go to the Quran in disregard of the sunnah. And then if you can't find, then you go to the sunnah. That's what that implies. Is that the way, the methodology that we're supposed to be upon? No? No, it ain't. Those two go hand in hand. Remember the narration of Mahdi Karim? Right? Where he said that the Prophet says, Allah wa inni utitul Quran wa mithlahu ma'ahu. I've been given the Quran and that which is like it along with it. According to Al Khattabi, what is intended, I've been given the Quran, yani wahyun yutla, dahir, wa wahyun la yutla, wa lakinnu ma sawa. I have been given two types of revelation. One that is used to abud and his salah, and it is used for ibad and salah. The other revelation you don't use for that, but they have the same type of strength. And this one says, I give him the Quran and that which is like it. Khabbabi says, what is intended here, yani, to actually introduce new legislations, this is what is intended, or to specify what is general, or to restrict that which has been unrestricted or absolute. And so the sunnah then goes hand in hand with the Qur'an. So the understanding that some of the people have when they hear sunnah, they think, oh man, you can leave it aside. Right? Whether it comes in the form of a command or not. Well, that's the sunnah. That understanding is not a very good understanding. Sometimes that understanding is correct if you're using the word sunnah as opposed to that which is wajib. And this is compulsory, and this is sunnah, meaning optional, mandu or mustahab. Then you may leave this aside, all right, because it's optional. But normally the sunnah, especially with the muhaddithin, is more general than that. Because it includes everything that the Prophet wasallam said, what he did, what he acknowledged, including his own characteristics, how he looked and how he conducted himself. So it's very comprehensive. And we find that comprehensive thing being applied in the ahadith itself. The Prophet ﷺ in the hadith of Anas ibn Malik, مَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّةِ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي 
whoever desires other than my son is not of me. In the hadith of Amr ibn al-As, <coughs> which we find both in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad and in the Sunnah, where he had married this lady from the Quraysh, فَكَانَ لَا يَأْتِيهَا كَانَ يُشْغِلُهُ الصَّوْمَ الصَّلَاةِ he, used, he married this lady from the Quraysh and he never used to actually be intimate with her. He used to be preoccupied with salah and fasting. And the Prophet ﷺ came and he advised him to read the Quran. Right? Every month he says, Inni utiqu akthara min dalik. I'm able to do more than that. Prophet said, do it every 15 days. I'm able to do more than that. Every seven, I'm able to do more than that. Every three days. Right? And then the Prophet told him to fast this way, that way. And then the Prophet taught him. Every day, li kulli amalin shirwa, wa li kulli shirratin fatwa. Yani shirra here, is the period of activity every deed that you do there's a period when you're energetic and you want to do a little bit more and this period that has energy has a slowing down period fatra yani a period where you no longer have the same energy and the prophet وسلم, said whose ever period of energy is according to the sunnah faqad aflaha wa anja he has been successful and safe and whose ever slowing down period is outside of the sunnah, he has been destroyed. Meaning then, that whatever you do it has to be coextensive with the sunnah for you to be saved. And here lies the importance of understanding what the sunnah is all about. And it's general, very general. So, in the light of this, Every time we hear the word sunnah, it doesn't mean something optional. Okay? Ibn Mas'ud in a narration collected by Muslim. Man saruhu an yalqa Allah ghada al-Musliman falyuhafiz ala haulai salawati haythi yunada bihim. Whoever would like to meet Allah tomorrow as a Muslim, let him guard these prayers where the event is given. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ قَنْ شَرَعَ لِنَبِيِّكُمْ سُنُنَ الْهُدَى وَإِنَّهُنَّ مِنْ سُنُنَ الْهُدَى He says, because Allah has legislated for your Prophet وسلم, the pathways of guidance, and these are pathways of guidance. And then he goes on and he says, لَوْ تَرَكْتُمْ سُنَّةَ نَبِيِّكُمْ لَضَلَلْتُمْ If you were to give up the sun of your Prophet وسلم, you would go astray. So the concept then of sunnah is a little bit more general than we find in some of the books of fiqh where sunnah is normally used as opposed to that which is compulsory and is something optional. That is not normally or it's not the only usage that we have of the word. Right? Especially when it comes to aqidah and manhaj. Right? Okay, no, no. This concept of ikhtalaf ahlul ilm, you know, that's where you sit on that. You sit on that. Laysa minhu ma laysa minhu ma lam yushar'ahu Allah wa Rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that which is not, yani, of it, which has not been legislated by Allah or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because those two go hand in hand. <coughs> he says, whoever does this introduces fahurat. It shall be يعني فإنه مردود عليه حتى وإن صدر عن إخلاص. It will be rejected even though a person does it sincerely. So, what is this saying that you know sincerity is not enough? That's only one part of what is important. That comes in in the malamadu biniyat, right? This is the other half of the coin. This is the other half of the coin, mutabaitu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As some of the Ahlul Ilm says, tawheedul mutaba'a, singling out the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for this particular status. Okay? <clears throat> so, here, a person who does that introduces that which is not in this deen of us or shariatina, that which is not of it. He will have it rejected, even if he's sincere. 
Okay? <clears throat> That's the first thing. Secondly, <clears throat> a person might not have introduced the thing. No one, I mean, not everybody introduces an innovation. When people come <clears throat> and they have certain ideas, certain creeds, rebellion against the leaders is not something that everybody is upon. Right? But we have certain movements where, you know, it's, it's, it's considered halal. But if you read the books of Aqidah, whether it's Aqidah Tahawiyyah, Lu'mat al or the Sharh of some of the books of Sunnah, all right, Barbahari Usul al Sunnah, or any of them, we find that the Ahl al Ilm Qadiman wa Hadithan ala Sunnah, it tafaqu ala shayin wahid. They agree, whether they are past or present, that this is something that is not to be done. It says, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, says, told the companions, even if they flog you and take your wealth, right? You've heard about Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi hmm? Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi how many people did he kill Sabran? I forgot the number, or the numbers. Was it 10,000 or 100,000? I don't know. Yani, that he had executed in his presence. Now that sound like a just person? Look. Hajjad was so bad. In spite of all of that, in spite of all of that, did Anas ibn Malik pray behind him? What about Abdullah ibn Umar? Did they pray behind him? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Why do you think they did that? Because they didn't yani, see his wrongdoing? That they didn't dislike his oppression? They did it, why? Because in the text, the Prophet ﷺ said, don't do it. Unless you see some clear proof, يعني, as the Ahlul Ilm said, لا يحتمل تأويل. It has no possible other interpretation other than clear kuf. Then that gives you justification now to go and raise up arms against it. Other than that, it's not permissible. This is why when the people came to Imam Ahmad, and Imam Ahmad, think about this, Imam Ahmad was in a time where he had a number of khulafa that were calling to something that Imam Ahmad considered kufrun. So much so that whoever yani, said that the Quran was created, right? That was kufr. And those man tawaqqafu wa asharrun. And the one who was cautious and stayed back, you know, I'm going to say this or that, he's worse than the one who's clear. Still, when the people came to Imam Muhammad and asked about, you know, man, look, this is going on. Should we not raise a bomb? He says, لا هذا خلاف لا ثار. Don't do it. This goes against the text. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Tamir, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he deals with this issue, he said, in spite of Imam Muhammad having this general, this general statement that whoever says this is kuf, it was not applied specifically because he looked at the condition of the individual and who had surrounding him. Who he had surrounding him, blocking him from even paying attention to the hujjah that was presented to him. Now, I want you to consider that caution Imam Muhammad. Everybody know Imam Muhammad, right? <laughs> Look, man, Imam Muhammad. Imam Muhammad. Right? They took him and they flogged him and they flogged him and to make sure that he got really flogged after every two stripes, he changed the people. 
Right? At this time, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah ta'ala, kana mudmina lisaw, was constant in fasting. In this weakened state, never once did he slip in presenting the hujjah for the people of the Sunnah. So much so that the people around him says, "Ma ra'ina ashad the qalb minhu," a person whose heart was firmer than Imam Ahmad. Wallahi, not once did he went and fumbled in presenting Allah's hujjah to the people, in spite of what he was undergoing. Right. I mean, the only reason they let him go is because they thought that he wasn't going to live. And they feared the rebellion of the common people if Imam Ahmed had died under this state. So take him home. He was so bad that prior to passing away, man, all he was passing was urine, was blood. That was his urine, blood. Thick blood. Right? In spite of that, in spite of what happened to Imam Ahmad, why did he say, Hada khilafu la This goes against the text. It's because his, base, his, his, his decision was not based on emotionalism. It was based on the text. Allah said such and such. The Prophet وسلم, said such and such. This is the yardstick that we use to conduct ourselves. And that separates the people from the son of the people from Ahwa, the people who follow their desires. Because everything you look at, man, it was bad. People were being actually killed. Killed. Imam Ahmed says, no man, you can't do that. So the principles that we work on, Yanni, in terms of how we conduct ourselves, how we have our outlook, the way we view things, is based on the text according to the manage of those who preceded us. And it's crucial. Because every time people go outside of that, you lose the protection that we promised. That's why innovations are so seriously bad and wrong in our deen. And why the believers who are trying to get on the methodology of the Salaf, you can't keep quiet about it. And those issues that people have that they're emotional about, man, look, man, such and such is the case. There are certain issues, man, where the lay people shut up. And you leave it for the Ahlul Ilm. Right? Allah mentions in the Quran <clears throat> when something of security and peace or the khawf came to them, Adarubi, they just spread it out. If they had only referred back to a Rasul wa ulil amri minhum and those who had ilm and knowledge from amongst them, they would have been able to tell them how to conduct themselves, how to deduce the laws that they can apply in their lives to get out of it. Not for everybody to go and say, man, look, man, this is going on, I feel. We have a methodology, man. There are certain things that we deal with as common people. There are certain things we leave for those who are grounded in knowledge to make decisions on. That's a part of our manager also. And that is to keep things the way they're supposed to be kept. Purtushi, he said, look, the people are never weakened from the position of the scholars. It's when you remove them that the people are likely to be approached from left and right. And he mentioned the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, Allah doesn't take the ilm away from just taking it out of the hearts of the people. He takes it away by removing the scholars and tell, look, the books are going to be here. Still got the books, got the Bukhari Muslim. Right? And you got some interpretations that nobody, you ain't here, your father ain't here, your grandfather never heard of. So Allah takes the knowledge, not by moving the books, by moving the scholars, the people who understand the text. Until he doesn't leave any of them, Aliman, they take people who were ignorant, ignorant, and placed in the forefront. 
and they do what? They dhallu wa adhallu. They go astray and lead others astray. So one of the things <clears throat> that we know, look, the protection is by having that methodology being connected in this way with the people of knowledge. And you prefer their books over the other people's books. And you definitely ain't supposed to read no books of innovation. Whether it's on aqidah or anything else. To protect yourself. Ibn Qudam in his book, Lumit al he says, when speaking about the methodology that helps to preserve us and save us, he says, and you don't read their books. You don't read their books. Right? People have this, this type of false mentality that in order to be enlightened, you need to widen your horizons. That may be correct in Christianity, but not in Islam. You know, you're supposed to, you know, go and just check it all out. Right? You know, you get to check it. You get witchcraft and sorcery. Right? You get, oh, I mean, everything that Habba Wadab is on there. Everything. And you're supposed to check it out. That's not what we're taught in our deen. You're not supposed to do that. That's why you choose the companions you sit with. Right? You don't go, you know, a person, man, is calling to everything out there other than the way that has been specified by Allah and His Messenger. You're going to rub shoulders with him. A person came to Uzai, he says, I'm going to sit with the people of the Sunnah and the people of innovation. Right? Uzai says, هذا الرجل يريد أن يساوي بين الحق والباطل. He says, this man intends to make truth and falsehood the same. It's not something you do. It's not something you do. It goes against the Quran, goes against the Sunnah, goes everything that we taught. Okay? So, <clears throat> innovations. Stay away from it. No matter how sincere the people seem to be, you're not supposed to, yani, it's not to be introduced anything in our deen, and it's not to be acted upon. This other part of the narration, Man amruna, the one who acts upon it, he shall have his deed rejected. Okay? Shaykh Uthameen, he said, هذا الحديث أصل من أصول الإسلام. This is one of the foundations of the foundation of an Islam. He said, دل عليه قولهم تعالى It's indicated in the statement of Allah the Exalted وأن هذا سراط مستقيما فاتبعوا ولا تتبعوا السبل فتفرق بكم عن سبيله ذلكم مساقم به لعلكم تتقوا Right? Do you remember the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did and يعني, what he did and then recited this? Yeah, look, we talking about Muslims, right? Some people got a feeling, man, we are all brothers and everybody's cool. Right? That's, that's the attitude that some people have, man. We are all Muslims and everybody's cool. That's what Allah taught us. That's what the Prophet Wasallam taught us. That everybody's cool. Look, man, he said this Ummah is going to be divided into 73 different groups, religious groups. Did he say everybody's cool? No, man. 72 in the fire. That ain't cool. And one in paradise. Al Jama'a, the group. The definite article here is what they call Alif al -ahd. At the time this particular narration was given, the Jama'a was who? Huh? It was the Sahaba. This is why that other narration which is found in Tirmidhi, which has been deemed Hassan by Shaykh Nasr, it says, what I am upon my companions. So not everybody is cool then. 
If that's the case, we need to find out then who is. What are some of the signs that these people are on the right path? What are the ma'alim, what are the yani, indications? There is a methodology laid out in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And that methodology is what? The Qur'an, the Sunnah, based on the understanding of who? Hey. Hey. Is there a verse that indicates this? وَمَنْ يُشَاقِكَ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ السَّبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نَوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمُ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Whoever shows opposition to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the truth has been made clear to him we will leave him and what he chooses for himself what? No, no, no and he follows other than the way of the believers now, was it sufficient? I mean, whoever shows opposition to the messenger, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he chooses, she chooses other than the way of the believers. Shows that there is something else in terms of consideration when we speak about our deen that we have to have in the forefront of our minds. And that's what the Prophet taught his companions. This is why Ibn Mas'ud, when he came to them, he says, look man, here are the companions. When Abdullah ibn Mas'ud went to the Khawarij, he said, جِئْتُكُمْ مِنْ عِنْدِي أَصْحَابَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم عَلَيْهِمْ نَزَلَ الْوَحِي هُمْ أَعْلَمْ بِتَأْوِيلِهِ I just came to you from the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Revelation came down on them. Meaning that they sat at the feet of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and his time the verses were revealed and taught and presented to them from Allah's Messenger. And they know better its interpretation. And you look around, and I see none of them with y'all. And all of the ilm is over there. And I'm looking over here, not one of them is something wrong with this picture here. So he was giving them, and he looked, just like giving my soul, look, man, if you didn't understand the text, you should look. See the people who was there and taught by the Prophet, all of them over there. All of them. They were sincere. They had their first hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, ikhlas. But they were lacking in the other half. Right? We have a lot of groups like that. They, you know, sincere. You know, they come around. They do the gush. You know, they get up and do the bayan after the salah. Right? They go out for 40 days. Right? And all of that. <clears throat> they do that. And they sincere about what they do. But is it based on the Quran and the Sunnah and the methodology of the Salaf? No, it's not. I'm going to tell you it's not. Because I used to move with them. I don't tell nobody that. Right? And uh, so <clears throat> I know them from the inside out. They have a person in the masjid, look, he's in the corner, and everybody else goes out and do jola. You know why he's in the corner? Huh? No, nah, but he's the connection between Allah and the group, man. Yeah, that's what that means? Yeah. He's the connection between Allah and the group, man. Right? Yeah. Anyway, the point is, yeah, the point is, yeah, the connection wasn't good. So, I'm saying, look, sincerity is not enough. We've seen it everywhere, you know. And so we need to understand the methodology, first of all, to save ourselves and to be able to pass it on to others who don't know. There's a methodology that has been laid down. The Prophet وسلم, when he drew that line, he says, Ah, this Allah. This is Allah's way. And then he pointed to the others, he says, Ha the Subul Mutafariqa. Wa ala kulli sabil and minha shaytan yarulay. And at the head of every diverse path there is a devil. That's inviting to it. He ain't inviting Muslims to Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism. 
He ain't using voices from the Bible necessarily. Right? But he's calling away from Allah's way in the name of Islam. Quoting the Quran, quoting the Sunnah, but he's off of it. So what's lacking is the understanding. The Khawarij, <clears throat> think about it. They used to recite the Quran day and night. And we know what the Prophet وسلم, said about their recitation. He said about their salah and all of that. As a matter of fact, when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud entered upon their encampment, he said, he just came from the companions. He says, I saw a people. Ma ra'aytu ahadan ashadda minhum ishtihad. And never seen anyone exerting themselves like these people do. Right? He says, Aidihim kathifin al ibil. Their hands were like the calluses on the feet of camels, man, from constant prayer. And their faces had these big old bumps on them. Minathar al sujood. From the sign of constantly doing optional prayer. That, that act of sincerity didn't help him a whole lot. One of the companions that was with Ali bin Abi Talib took his land, stuck him in. He just said, Ubashur Kabinna. He said to the Kharij, I give you glad time in the fire. And the man looked at him, he says, Ta'alamuna ayuna awla biha salina. You will know which one of us deserve to burn most. He thought he was right. Yet Allah's messenger called him Kilabun Na, the dogs of hell, the dogs of the fire. So sincerity is not sufficient. It has to be mutabah. And as pointed out, the Sheikh pointed out this particular verse, you know, this is my way. It's a straight way. And anything else that you follow will you do away from Allah's way. Even if the person calling calls himself a Muslim. And herein lies the reason why it's important wajib on the Muslims to recognize that you have to distinguish yourselves. If everybody ain't all right. Everybody is not it's not okay, yeah, we all Muslims, man, you cool. Right? You got people, man, cursing the companions. Speaking about Aisha radiallahu anha in a way that you wouldn't even, you would seek refuge if it crossed your mind. Speaking about the Quran in a way and you saying, yeah, yeah, we all right. You have people working to undo, undermine the deen because of their freelance interpretation. Right? And we're supposed to be, everything is cool, yeah man, y'all all right, y'all, we are in the man, mu'min wa ikhwa. Muslims are brothers. What happens to, kuntum khayra ummati l'ukhrijat min nas? Ta'amaruna bil ma'ruf, wa tanhawna ala munkah, wa tu'minuna billah. Wal asr. You are the best because you command what is right and forbid what is wrong. If people are affecting the issues of aqidah and manhaj and you're going to keep silent about it, it's not the way the Muslim is supposed to be. But we first have to know what we're supposed to be upon, recognize it so that we can recognize what is outside of that. Okay? <clears throat> For you. Hey, no, no, alivanas. No, so he. But the Shaykh says, so you have ikhlas wathani al mutab al rasul. The first is sincerity, the other one following the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In this hadith, he says there are some fawaid. There are some benefits from this hadith. Okay, the first benefit: tahrim hadathi shayin fi din Allah. Walau an husn qasdin. The first thing is. The prohibition from introducing anything in the Allah's deen, even if the intention is good. Now, normally when you speak about innovations, <clears throat> people have your tendency to say, well, you mean we can't ride cars? It means you, you mean we, 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 we can't go in airplanes? Because those are innovations. Right? <clears throat> You're trying to take us back into camel age. When we speak about innovations, and we speaking about 
What are we speaking about? We are speaking about things of ibadat wal i'tiqad. Essentially. Okay? Al Shatili pointed out that there is sometimes when that particular concept can be extended to other areas as well. But essentially we're speaking about the things you introduce in the deen in respect to worship and your creed. We're not talking about the open air well, you know, man, that means we gotta wear sandals and all that. They don't understand the issue, period. That's why that objection is presented. They don't understand. Okay, we're not talking about that. So, <clears throat> we're talking about things that have to do with the religion itself. That even if a person has good intentions, this is something that is unacceptable. That's the first benefit. He says, the Sheikh says, <clears throat> <clears throat> even if the heart feels this gentleness because of that and it's yuqbil alayhi and it's something that is inclined to doing he says even if this is the case because this is of the actions of shaitan I don't know how many brothers have been involved in tasawwuf the Sufi path don't raise your hand. You don't have to do that. You know, I see some faces that, right? But they, when they read their, the, when they do these awrad, they get a type of sensation that is pleasing, right? It's comfortable. Yeah, they get all kinds of stuff, but. <clears throat> That sensitivity, that emotionalism, is not going to be used as a yardstick for what is right. You know, I've had a person say, well, it feels so good, how could it be wrong? Ask a person who's smoking, t taking crack. Right? Or that person who's a, a I mean, he's an alcoholic. Right? Or some other things that are extremely pleasurable. How could it be wrong? Because it's wrong in the Quran, it's wrong in the Sunnah. Okay? And simply using the sensations and the emotionalism as a determinant that this is right or wrong is not what we do as Muslims. They found out, <clears throat> they had a Times thing where they found out that if a person recited anything repeatedly, it causes some type of release of certain hormones or certain things, chemicals, and it gives you this sense of yani, enlightenment and delight. You could say dog, 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 right? And you have the same type of emotional state, right? The Hare Krishnas, om, 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 mean nothing. But they have that type of feeling. So when the, now the Sufis come, they say, Allah, 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 like that. It's not, you cannot use that experience, that sensitivity, that emotionalism to say it's right. We as Muslims, we are given guidance to tell us what is right and wrong. In the Quran, the Sunnah, and how the companions and the students understood it. Not what we feel, right? That's what the Sufi says. That's Christianity if you've ever seen it. My heart has narrated to me from my Lord. Christians, man, and, and, and the Lord spoke to me. They do it all the time. I mean, we, we grew up in this in, in a society like this, and this is what they do. To show off is the same thing. It's one of their things. So that emotionalism, as the Sheikh pointed out, as long as in the evasion, you don't look at your emotions to determine. It's not a yardstick for determining what is right and wrong. We have the text. The methodology is clear. Okay? <clears throat> but you, hey, the Sheikh, he, he mentions here, in <clears> qala <throat> qailun, لو أحدثت شيئا أصله من الشريعة ولكن جعلته على صفة معينة لم يأتي به الدين فهل يكون مردودا أم لا هل يكون مردودا أو لا 
if I were to introduce something, it has some basis in the deen. But <clears throat> the form that is used to enact this thing is not found in the Sharia. Is this going to be rejected or not? They say the answer for that. The Sheikh said, Well, you are you going to want to do that? It's going to be rejected. Okay? <clears throat> he says, مثل ما أحدثه بعض الناس من العبادات والأذكار والأخلاق وما أشبهها في مردودة Like some of the things that the people introduce of acts of worship or أذكار ذكر remembrance and other characters or what is similar is rejected the, the Sufis they have what they call awrad and the awrad or these specific type of remembrance they're made up from the sheikh Right? He tells you which you do and how many times. Or he takes something, some expressions from the Quran or Sunnah and he gives a specific number to it that you should adhere to. Right? And he does this for you. And uh, <clears throat> those types of things or a specific type of worship that you do, all of those things, yani, if it has some basis but the format was not there, in the time of the Prophet وسلم, one of the Sahaba is going to be rejected. Our time is up, actually. <clears throat> and uh, we continue this discussion, inshallah. Actually, we extended it a little bit longer than we wanted to for this particular section, but because of the issue at hand, innovations, I thought it necessary to go in a little bit more, and maybe the next time we'll add a little bit more of two also, inshallah. So we're going to close down right now. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika shadu wa lahi la'an tastakfiru wa tubi lahi.